Hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, I think we will go ahead and get started since time is limited. Uh, I am Emma LeBlanc. I am a LEAP Fellow at the Law School, and I am very excited to introduce you to our speakers today, Alice Crary and Lori Gruen, who are going to talk about their new book, Animal Crisis, which challenges us to think, I think, in very different ways about the politics of solidarity between humans and non-humans marginalized and exploited within capitalism. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I just want to ask everyone to make sure that they are muted and that they stay muted um, while others are speaking. Now that we're back in class, maybe we're forgetting our Zoom etiquette. Um, and we would love to see your faces, but totally understand if you're not in a position to turn on your camera right now. Uh, we will have time for some questions at the end, so feel free to throw those into the chat for me at any point and I can share them or when we get there, you can use the raise hand feature and I can call on people as well. So let me tell you about our guest today. Um, Professor Crary is University Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at the New School for Social Research. She's also currently a visiting fellow at All Souls College at the University of Oxford. A moral and social philosopher, Professor Crary has written widely on meta-ethics, moral psychology and normative ethics, philosophy and literature, philosophy and feminism, critical animal studies, critical environmental studies, critical disability studies, and critical theory. Her books include Inside Ethics on the Demands of Moral Thought, which examines representations of animals and humans in ethical discourse, and Beyond Moral Judgment, which challenges received images of the nature and difficulty of moral thought. Professor Gruen is the William Griffin Professor of Philosophy at Wesleyan University. She has written more than a dozen books, including Ethics and Animals, an introduction, and one of my favorites, Ecofeminism, Feminist Intersections with Other Animals and the Earth. She has another book coming out this year, Carceral Logics, which examines together the incarcerations of humans and the captivity of non-human animals. Her work focuses on those who have traditionally been overlooked by our ethical investigations, including women, people of color, incarcerated people, and non-human animals. Both of our guests today are leading scholars in the field doing what I think is some of the most provocative intersectional work on interspecies ethics and politics. And so their new book, which will be released this summer, begins with this juxtaposition or even tension that I think is a familiar to a lot of us who are here today between on the one hand, um, animal rights advocates and on the other marginalized human groups such as women, immigrants, people of color. And in animal ethics and animal law um, and other rights movements, um, we often treat, treat rights as this kind of scarce resource, right? Not enough to go around or even this zero sum game where gains for one come at a loss for another. But professors Crary and Gruen challenge that tension as it's self complicit in the structures of capitalist exploitation and domination that harm certain humans and non-humans. So instead, their book, drawing creatively on eco-feminist frameworks, looks at specific situated animals, pigs, rats, octopuses, and ticks among them, to explore these intersecting axes of domination as potential grounds for a solidarity that is, they argue, essential to overcoming structures of domination. So with that, I will hand things off to Professors Crary and Gruen. Thank you so much, Emma, especially for those incredibly generous introductions. We don't want to fail to start by thanking also Noah for reaching out and coordinating it with us about today's event. Emma, obviously, for engaging with the work. And we want to thank others at the at Law, Ethics, and Animals program, including Doug Kaiser, whom I can see, and Vivica Morris and the whole team for having us here today. Um, we're really delighted to have the opportunity to talk about animal crisis. We um, are a little uncertain. I hope Laurie will forgive me for saying that about exactly when it will be appearing in the US, but we think it will be available as an ebook in late May and as a regular book in August. Here's an initial compact description of the book just to get us started. 
A key theme of animal crisis is that the plight of non-human animals on the planet is urgent, demanding a commensurate response, and that animals are often hurt by social mechanisms that also hurt vulnerable humans. The academic field of animal ethics has for half a century been a central and important site for discussions about wrongs and harms to animals. But it's grown up in isolation from traditions of critical social thought that are concerned with examining harmful social mechanisms. Animal crisis aims to overcome this isolation and offer a meaningfully, meaningful, politically relevant rethinking of animal ethics in connection with critical social theory. A slogan for animal crisis might be, quote, animal ethics needs critical social theory. Within the book, we describe what we're offering as a new critical theory, specifically as critical animal theory. Now, one thing it means to reframe animal ethics as critical animal theory is to open ourselves in thinking about animals to new critical resources. Within the book, we register ways in which ideologies and material practices distort the lives and relationships of other animals alongside those of human beings. And we also take seriously that we may need engaged practices, things like explorations of cultural and historical perspectives in order to see beyond those distortions. Reconceiving animal ethics as critical animal theory for us also means avoiding the all too familiar tendency to use animals predicaments as occasions for mere ethical theory application and instead consistently starting one's reflections from animals experience, allowing these experiences to be one's guide, guiding critical resource. And that thought is the actually um, reflected in the entire method of the book in ways that Emma indicated already, but we're gonna be talking about today. Did you show the cover, Alice? Oh yeah, see, mm -hmm. two, things, two things at once. Right. Great, thank you. So that's our cover. Um, and I wanted to go to the next slide um, to also uh, just set things up to think about some of the real world impacts of the crises on humans and other animals. Recent photographs, as you see here, and videos of human war refugees with their companion animals on the left side for me, um, trying, you know, huddling in the subways in Ukraine, um, trying to get onto transports to safety is both heart wrenching and illustrative of the internet connected crises we're all confronting. We often don't think of what happens to other animals in war zones and the images that we keep seeing, I think helps to correct this oversight. From the beginning of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, for example, um, the Mykolaiv, zoo, when you see a couple of images here on the right side, was bombed. Half of the staff at the zoo was evacuated and some joined the war efforts fighting off the invaders, but the director of the zoo and his family stayed behind to, to care for the remaining stressed animals at the zoo. The impact of war on captive animals may be creeping into our consciousness more and more. There's a really important and interesting illustrated novel a book about um, the Baghdad Zoo in the context of the Iraq bombings. Um, and it heightens our awareness of the interlocking impacts of our planetary crises. Humans and non-humans may not be equally imperiled by the short-sighted human destruction that we're seeing, but we all are affected. And as you well know, animals are being killed at ever higher rates by cataclysms brought on by anthropogenic climate change. Roughly a billion animals were killed in the fires that scorched Australian landscapes during um, the hot season in 2019 and 2020. Um, the fires and unusually high temperatures in the US during the summer of 2021 killed many humans and animals too, including a startling number of sea animals, billions it's reported. Pollution and other human generated destruction haven't spared animals who fly, Billions of birds have vanished in nearly all areas of North America since the 1970s, a 30% loss in overall numbers. This silencing of bird song effectively augurs the strange stillness that Rachel Carson ominously and presciently foretold. The environmental reporter Brooke Jarvis noted, 
that what we're losing is not just biodiversity, not just the diversity part of biodiversity, but the bio part as well, life in sheer quantity. The world's largest king penguin colony shrank by 88% in 35 years. More than 97% of the bluefin tuna that once lived in the ocean are gone. The number of Sophie the giraffe toys sold in France in a single year is nine times the number of all the giraffes that still live in Africa. The reach of human activity into animal lives and environments is so extensive that it would be difficult to find any unaffected individual animal or animal population. The horrors that humans being that, that those of us humans visit on animals incidentally, as well as deliberately, are so great and of such massive proportions that once we begin to bring them into view, we can easily feel disoriented and unable to grasp the magnitude. If humans killed each other at the same rate we kill animals, we'd be extinct in 17 days. These crises demand an urgent response and our book drawing on philosophical, social and critical theory, insights from activists and grounded in the particular experiences of animals and humans in different contact zones is one response. Each of the chapters of Animal Crisis pairs a case devoted to experiences of particular animals with a theme there's a photograph at the opening of each chapter. And here you see the first four chapter photographs arranged clockwise in order. So the first pairing is crisis, orangutans. And the book opens with a story of an orangutan who in 2019 was shot more than 70 times with air pellets near a palm oil plantation, not far from Ache Sumatra and was rescued by the Sumatran orangutan conservation program. The initial topic is how human conflicts with orangutans have increased as their forest homes have been destroyed to make room for palm oil plantations. And we discuss issues of economic inequality alongside those of habitat destruction. We use this case as the backdrop for an overview of the crisis situation that Lori just described represented by human beings killing of animals, both indirectly through habitat destruction, pollution of land, air, and sea, and anthropogenic climate change related fires and floods, and also directly through the deliberate destruction of animals in hunting and in industrial agriculture. The second chapter pairing is ethics and pigs. With regard to a pig plant in Waterloo, Iowa, we talk about how during the early months of the pandemic, greater than ordinary attention was paid to conditions of human workers in industrial slaughterhouses and about how even when the facts of slaughter are in some sense acknowledged as they were then it can be hard to get one's mind around what's being done to animals and that's our lead-in to a discussion of a body of work on legal social material and linguistic practices that keep people from registering aspects of the treatment of animals, and also our lead into a discussion of how one achievement of some work in ethics is combating the distorting effects of such practices. The third pairing is suffering and cows. We tell the story of a cow, Ebony, who in 2020 escaped from a small dairy in New York's Hudson Valley, the kind of dairy often described as humane. Having been brought to a sanctuary called Vine in Vermont, Ebony soon gave birth to Cora, pictured here. I don't, I, I, at least the way the screen is showing up for me, I can't see. I think you can minimize so you can see the pictures on the right, um, hopefully. We also mm -hmm. talk about another cow who escaped in somewhat different circumstances and discuss what conditions for cows are like on the kinds of dairies in question. And we use these cases as segues to critically investigating the utilitarian tradition in animal ethics that comes from Peter Singer. That's the main portion of the book in which we talk about the discipline of animal ethics as it's ordinarily conceived today, though later we also talk about some Kant inspired work in animal ethics. Chapter four pairs um, minds and octopuses. 
And I'm noticing that my photos are out of order. So clockwise, you have to switch my cows and octopuses. This is a photograph that Australian philosopher of science um, and writer Peter Godfrey Smith generously allowed us to use. Here we give a reading of the 2020 Netflix documentary, My Octopus Teacher, which some of you may have seen. Filmmaker Craig Foster pairs a voiceover in which he describes professional burnout and related health problems with lush images of a female common octopus to whom going diving in kelp forests off South Africa's Western Cape, he develops an attachment and dives to sea every day. His documentary about his octopus teacher is as much Bildungsroman as it is naturalistic investigation. Foster talks about being overcome with feelings for the creature while also discussing and trying to interpret some striking behaviors. One review of the film claimed that its emotive takeaway sells short its scientific subject. And we use this as the lead in for a discussion of treatments of animal consciousness and self consciousness, in which, among other things, we talk about questions of method in animal behavioral studies. So, um, our, our fifth chapter, we pair. Rats and dignity. Um, rats are incredible animals and our relationships with rats are incredibly complicated. Research using rats have found that they engage in an empathy motivated behavior towards distressed companions. In one study that we discuss, one rat is placed in a small clear tube that the other rat can open with a little effort. It took a while for the free rats to figure out how to liberate the trapped rats, but once they did, they opened the doors for the trapped rats with remarkable consistency. The free rats even chose to open the door for the trapped rats in preference to eating chocolate chips. Think about that <laughs> if you're hungry for chocolate chips. Free rats who had already learned how to open tube doors were presented with two clear tubes, one that contained five chocolate chips and another that contained a trapped mate. Rather than always opening the tube with the chocolate and eating it all, half the time the free rats would release the trapped rat and then open the chocolate tube and share the treats. The researchers were shocked by these observations and studies that revealed the, that concern rats have for their conspecifics date back from the 1950s. So maybe that shock wasn't warranted. Rats continue to be used, however, to witness just how sensitive and caring they are to this day. Rats and mice are the most commonly used animals in research, as we know, and the bulk of the experiments are, of course, much more devastating to the animals and their friends than sharing chocolate treats. The number of rats who do meet their death at human hands extends far beyond the laboratory. Thought of as harbingers of disease and plagues, at least before more recent pandemics, which have now led many people to associate zoonotic disease with animals that are eaten, rats have been treated primarily as pests. Pests are a complicated category of beings. They're unwanted, they're in the wrong place at the wrong time, but they're also symbols of physical, psychological, and moral decay that must be disposed of. One recent example of human triumph over the pest came in July of 2017, when New York Mayor, then Mayor, um, Bill de Blasio committed $32 million to a rat reduction plan to help rid areas that have the most dirty and disgusting rats. The various agencies involved in the initiative heartily congratulated themselves on these heroic efforts, even before any rats were exterminated. One of the questionable impulses behind this pest control is the belief that there is something disgusting or filthy and contagious about the animals that warrant full out assaults on their very existence. The drive to rid animals who eat food supplies, leave droppings or spread disease from human spaces for living, work, public recreation and Sorry, public and public assembly is understandable, especially so when human beings are forced into close contact with the pets, with the pests by oppressive social structures, which add devastating social stigma to the very real threats that animals pose to human well-being. But it's possible, and we argue that 
it's something to think deeply about, to sympathize with the drive to exterminate or eradicate rats and other pests, while also being aware that they're creatures thrown into their situation and that they resemble many of the humans that are obliged to dwell in close proximity to them in being victims of circumstances. This awareness opens up a space for taking seriously the moral significance of animals like rats and other perceived pests. So within our discussion of rats and dignity, these sorts of reflections about rats are a segue to a positive proposal about animal moral worth that we introduce under the heading of animal dignity. We connect such dignity with the idea of being subject to wrongs beyond harms, the idea that humans sometimes treat animals wrongly and doing things to them that don't obstruct the exercise of any of the animal's capacities and don't interfere with any of their activities. Now, we have lots of examples, and you can surely think of your own. Here's one. Making a bear walk around on her hind legs, pushing a baby carriage dressed in a frilly pastel apron, as members at the Moscow Circus once did, is arguably a form of disrespect over and above the wrong done to her by holding her captive and making her perform, however unaware the bear herself is of the mockery. And here's a further example of a violation of animal dignity, bringing it back to rats. Even if in some cases it's warranted to move rats out of human spaces, there's arguably a further wrong in representing them as, as Lori just discussed, Bill de Blasio once did, as creatures who are disgusting and whose loathsome character allegedly justifies their annihilation. There's a small but notable literature on animal dignity, and animal dignity is a legal concept in some countries. Now we're focusing on it today partly because it's an intriguing theoretical puzzle. The very idea of animal dignity is sometimes regarded as an oxymoron. That's because dignity gets associated with human beings presumed moral superiority to animals. A key modern source for this familiar view of dignity is Kant's 1785 groundwork of the metaphysics of morals. Animal excluding understandings of dignity were influential through the 20th century. With the emergence of the contemporary animal protectionist movement, there have been attempts to theorize human moral worth and dignity in ways that recognize human animality and leave room for animal dignity but since the 2000s or 2010s and further, ideas of dignity as placement above animality have experienced something like a resurgence in the writings of a group of political philosophers, including George Kateb, Jeremy Waldron, and Michael Rosen. We trace the continued appeal of animal suppressing accounts of dignity to the persistence of the systematic denigration of animals noting that such denigration is foundational within advanced capitalist societies. We note that another source of the ongoing influence of human supremacist notions of dignity is the continued use of dehumanizing rhetoric associating unwanted humans with rats and other hated animals, which all too often is a prelude to atrocities. It's not difficult to understand why protests on behalf of members of human groups who are oppressed through animalization frequently insist that those targeted are humans and so elevated above the standing of mere animals. But it's not clear that the human privileging ideas of dignity evoked in these contexts actually have the egalitarian credentials that speak for alignment with liberating social movements. There's social psychological evidence for thinking that it's counterproductive to contest the dehumanization of humans through animalization in this way. Our main concern is noting that reliance on animal subjecting notions of dignity can be counterproductive because it doesn't challenge late capitalist trends towards treating animals and the rest of nature as no more than exploitable resources. The strategy risks being self-undermining because it reiterates a logic on which any human likened to animals is likewise aptly seen as a free resource and open to exploitation. 
So our aim is to describe and motivate forms of resistance that start by directly challenging this logic. And one of the first steps towards, oh, there, good. One of the first steps towards this impactful resistance um, is working to ensure that we have others clearly in view. And so in chapter six, we pair suffering, seeing, it, shouldn't, it says suffering here, but it should be seeing. Oh, pair, sorry. We, that's no problem. We pair seeing and parrots, um, and we discuss the terrible plight alluring parrots face, in part because of human desire to possess their beauty. We explore the complexities in chapter six um, involved in seeing others clearly, not through our own conscious or subconscious desires. Given the ways that animals have been instrumentalized and commodified, one of the major challenges we address is how to unpack the ideology that prevents us from seeing animals as subjects who can return our gaze. Films and other forms of artistic expression can help us to see animals. The pursuit of animal visibility together with the pursuit of other forms of social visibility and just want to shout out a recent, very recent publication that um, Alice and her colleague Matthew Congdens um, have just uh, guest edited of Phil Topics on the subject of social visibility. It's a brilliant, brilliant special edition, I, a special issue, and I highly recommend it. Um, but this idea of social, social visibility and animal visibility involves not only reshaping individuals' sense of the importance of the lives of humans and other animals and sharing those newly developed senses with others, but also acting on these new visions to change the world. I do just wanna mention about our parrots here, um, that these are rescue parrots at a sanctuary in Rhode Island um, that has um, been in um, existence for quite a while. Um, and they're also the subject of a film that we also discuss in um, chapter six called Parrot Confidential. In our final chapter, chapter seven, we pair ticks and other insects with politics. We are interested in the ways in which insects are ignored, vilified, or misunderstood. We discuss how devastating human insect conflicts have been and with the illnesses and death from human, that humans suffer from insect-borne diseases, like for example, Lyme disease. And we also discuss what's been called the insect apocalypse and what it portends for the future of life on earth. Focusing on ticks brings into focus the very complex relationships that we have with non-human animals and non-human others more broadly. And we bring our ecofeminist sensibilities to bear on the thoughts about how we can radically reorient our relationships. It's possible, we argue, without delusive dreams of moral untaintedness to seek solidarity in resisting ingrained structures of violence, exploitation, and commodification that threaten the lives and well beings of humans and other animals alike. And this isn't going to be an easy task. It also isn't an easy book to read, our book, but we must confront the animal crisis before it's too late. Thank you.